good to see you. Good to be with you. I'm excited about our passage today. Adam just prayed, but let me pray for God to open his word uh, for us this morning. Would you bow with me? Lord, it's a great moment as we come to your word, and uh, we come with great expectation that you are going to speak to us and that you're going to change us in some way uh, for, from what we hear. So thank you now for the mercy that your Holy Spirit, in his own mysterious way, connects with each person. I, I love it when someone says, you were talking right to me, and uh, that's because your Holy Spirit is here to speak to each of us. So um, open your word and let us hear from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, I, I want to, uh, I'm just reminded this morning, um, we celebrated a memorial service in this room yesterday for someone who is much loved and known to many of you in the church, uh, Jack Rickert. Uh, if you didn't know, Jack uh, passed away about three and a half weeks ago, and Jack was the guy you'd always see at the top of the stairs, the older gentleman who then at Christmas time would grow a beard so he could be Santa Claus, and uh, he passed away, like I said, about a month ago, and we had a beautiful service, and um, some of his family's here today, but you know, you would all ask about him. You'd say, how's Jack? And I just wanted to let you know, Jack passed on to be with uh, his father in heaven, and uh, it was a beautiful service, remembering a beautiful life. So Jack was one of us, and I loved him, and I miss him. I'm going to miss him. Um, today, we're going to be looking at uh, what happened on Palm Sunday. And if you're new around here and don't know much about, you know, the story, Palm Sunday, you know, is the day when the palms were kind of uh, raised before Jesus as he made his entry into Jerusalem, and we're going to see that. And we're going to focus uh, particularly on John's gospel, John's telling of these events. It's going to be in chapter 12. Uh, certainly, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other gospel writers, have comments on this, and we'll just draw on a couple of those, but mostly we're going to be focusing on John's retelling of the events of this day. So we're going to uh, begin in uh, chapter 12 of John, and let's take a look at that passage as we put it up here. It's the beginning, verses 1 and 2. It begins like this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was, the, was among those reclining at the table with him. So, if you were reading in John, in chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He's been in a grave, or more properly, in a tomb. He'd been in a tomb for four days and uh, Jesus is now with him and his two sisters, who are Martha and Mary. And the site of the party is Bethany, which is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And this is where Jesus is going to meet his destiny on Holy Week. He goes there actually to precipitate the crisis that will lead to his death. Now, Luke had recorded in his gospel account um, Jesus' view on going to Jerusalem. And it's found in Luke 9, and it goes like this. As the time approached for him... For Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, let me just stop and say something here. This is one of the things I love about Jesus as you read about him in the Gospels. Um, despite any appearances to the contrary, nothing ever happens to him. He's always in control of the events of his life. You know, even when things, and especially when things look out of control, he's not driven by circumstances. He is driving them for his purposes, because, of course, he's God in the flesh. Now, let's think about this dinner. It's at the home of a man named Simon the leper. Now, I don't know, you know if you find this in the Bible, but there's some names that get a little confusing. Guess how many Simons there are in the New Testament? There's actually, anybody want to guess? Yeah, you, you don't know. I wouldn't have known either. There's nine Simons. Uh, we know probably Simon Peter, you could have named that, Simon the Zealot, there's Simon the Leper. Let me read this uh, uh, Matthew's parallel account that kind of identifies um, this situation. It's in Matthew 26. While Jesus was in Bethany, and here's the detail, in the home of Simon the Leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. That's what we're going to be seeing in John. Now, I, I don't know if you can appreciate this, but when you're a leper and you invite people to a party, most times they're not coming. <laughs> I don't know, it's something about this contagious disease that consumes your limbs that makes people say, I'm taking a pass. <laughs> so apparently, Jesus had healed this guy. You know, he'd healed him. And so for our purposes today, we're going to call him Simon the ex-leper. It's just better. If you're doing invitations, it's better for sure. Now, there's a whole lot of gratitude at this dinner party because Simon, the ex-leper, as I'm calling him, is there with his two sisters, Martha and Mary, and it's hosted by 
Lazarus, the ex-dead guy. Okay? So Lazarus had spent four days dead, and now an ex-leper is hosting a party for an ex-dead guy. I mean, it must have been interesting to be around Jesus in those days because you couldn't stay dead or sick around him that well. I mean, he was amazing, right? But the thing is, this story isn't about them. It's just creating the setting, but it can get lost. It's like an ex-leper and an ex-dead guy are at this dinner, but it's not about them. It's actually about someone else. There's one person who makes the events of this moment not about gratitude for healing or being raised from the dead, but the story is, not surprising when you're looking at Jesus, about love. It's about adoration. And if I may say this very gently, if you don't love Jesus, you don't know him yet. Because to know him is to love him. That's okay. You can get to know him, and I hope you do. I, I say this from personal experience. I deeply love Jesus. I owe him everything. Any success in my life is due to him. He sees my failures and loves me anyway. I am nothing without Jesus. My mission in life is to help people see and know the love of Jesus. Now, are you ready for the love in the chapter? Ready for some love? Come on, give it to me. You ready for some love? We're the doctor of love here. I'm a doctor. I'm the doctor of love. I'm bringing the love here. Don't quote me on that, but I know it's on the internet forever. If my wife was here, she'd be doing that, you know. Then Mary, it says in John 12, 3. Then Mary took about a pint, which is about a half a liter. So think about a two-liter soda bottle and, you know, take that in quarter. So, you know, about a half liter of pure nard, an expensive perfume. And by the way, has anybody smelled the nard in the room today? You smell it? Okay, that's nard. I've been infusing the room with nard today. There's some diffusers in the back with fans, and there's boxes of tissues that I poured aromatic um, nard on. So if it's under your chair, you might be smelling it strongly back here and over here. Just don't blow your nose with that, or you will smell like nard for a week. I left the home yesterday, and my daughter said, you've been smelling a lot like, uh, you've been putting on too much cologne lately. And I said, it's nard, dear. It's, it, you know, but she, she just didn't want to get over that. Um, okay, so again... The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, and that's why I put it into the room today. Now, other accounts in the other Gospels uh, tell of the uh, nard being poured all over the body of Jesus, but John's account focuses on the feet because what happens is, you know, of course, it pulls at his feet, and she uses her hair to wipe it off, and so that's what he's focusing on. But there's one thing I really want you to see here, and that is the extravagance of Mary's love for Jesus, the extravagance of her love for him. What she uses is expensive. It was, you know, um, you'd get it in the Himalayas. You know, you would purify these plants that apparently were a lot like uh, honeysuckle. And so it was hard to get, and it was expensive. Um, Judas will later say in our passage that the amount that she used was, would cost a year's wages. That's expensive. And the other thing I want you to see is she breaks all the conventions of her day in the way she wipes his feet with her hair. Now, let me just tell you something here. Um, in that culture women didn't let their hair down in public. I mean, we even have an expression in our day, right? She, you know, she let her hair down. And it's a little different, but that means she kind of, you know, got relaxed and just kind of became herself. Well, in that culture, it was actually seen as kind of sultry. And you know those, you know, hair ads where a woman kind of takes her hair out of the bun and it, you know, it's like, I, I'm doing my best to uh, impersonate it because <laughs> I don't have that kind of hair. But you know, it's like, and it's kind of like, oh, that's, you know, that's kind of sultry. And so that's what it was, especially in those days, because people didn't do that. But Mary has poured this half liter of nard on Jesus, and when she sees it pooling at his feet, she lets down her hair to wipe off the excess. Now, you know, I'm describing it, but try to feel the moment. The men reclining at the table, as they do, on an elbow, and this woman pouring this on his body, on his feet, and then letting her hair down, and because there's excess wiping it with her hair. Do you, do you feel the, the intimacy? I mean, I don't know what word you'd think of, but it, it's quite a moment. To her, Jesus is so wonderful that all the day's conventions are discarded if they get in the way of her loving him. It's like, I don't care who's looking. I don't care what anybody's saying. I want to love Jesus. Now, why did she love him so much? There's only one reason why anybody loves Jesus like this. Because she had felt his love for her. You know, John writes in one of his epistles, we love because he first loved us. Don't let that be theology. That's just 
heart stuff. We love because we go, he's loved me. And that's why we return the love. She'd felt his love for her. And I'm going to tell a story. It's just from the previous chapter about when Jesus came through, when her brother had died. And of course, as we said, he raised her from the dead. But what I want you to watch for here is not the facts of the story, but the emotions of the story as you watch Jesus' emotional reaction to Mary's loss. I'm reading now from John 11. So there was this thing with Martha and Mary, and I'm going to jump in at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, let me try to say this with the feeling she might have had. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd only been here. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who'd come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? Well, come and see, Lord. And Jesus begins weeping. The Son of God begins weeping. And you know what the Jews say? See how he loved him. That's what strikes them. There's only one thing that will cause you to fall in love with Jesus. When you experience his love, it changes you. Mary had that. And when you see how the Son of God responds to a woman over the grief of the loss of her brother, you know, he weeps and the onlookers go, oh, he did love him. And that, by the way, friends, is what this meeting's about today. We are here because we are people who have experienced the love of Jesus. Maybe not everybody. You may be an onlooker, which is fine. We're glad you're here. But we sing because we've experienced the love of Jesus, and we say, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, because we've been loved by him. Now, I know all of you. I know you have a place inside of you that's hurt and broken. I say that because we all do. I do, you do. I remember when I was starting out in ministry, um, you know, I heard that theory that we all are broken in some way. Um, I knew it in theory. Now I know it from experience. I don't care how accomplished you are. I don't care what pedigree you have, what degrees you have. But as I get to know you, I know you all have brokenness. I, I get to experience that sometimes as you come in and talk to me. Every single one of you, including me, has something. It's just that, that sadness that comes from something that happened to you, some trauma that happened. And I look around and I say, I know every one of you has it. And when you bring that need and hurt before Jesus, and he says to you, and you feel him say, it's okay, I know, I love you, I was actually there. I want to heal you, but I'm going to walk through this with you. It makes you love him. Or when you have something in your past you're ashamed of, and you go, oh, God, if I ever was honest with you about some of the things I did in my life, you, you, there's no way you could love me. And then you get the guts to kind of open that up to him, and he goes, no, I do love you. That's put aside. I love you so much. That love changes us, and that's what changed Mary. And I'm going to tell you what we learned from this moment with Mary. Ready for it? Friend, you can never be too extravagant in your love for Jesus. You hear me? You can never, ever be too extravagant in your love for Jesus. You know, when I think about my life and I think about the things I may regret, I think that I might get to the end of my life and regret that I didn't love my wife better. Right? That I didn't show her love better. And then I try to adjust myself. I know I will get to the end of my life and think I didn't love Jesus enough and didn't show him enough love. But he's going to then say to me, it's okay, Mark. I love you. He's going to hold me, and I'm going to just weep in joy that he loves me so much. But what makes Mary's love stand out even more is the contrast that John paints. This is the obvious point of the passage, the context of where they are. It's the contrast between Mary's love and Judas's greed and lack of love, okay? And that's where we're going to go next. Look at how Judas reacts to what Mary does. We're now in verse 4. 
But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, what does Judas think they should have done, or she should have done? She should have sold it and given it to the poor. And he was a guy who was a thief, so he couldn't quite get it out to say, why don't you give it to us so I can skim off some of it? But underneath what he says is his core belief, and it's shocking when you see it for what it is. Do you know what Judas believes, but he can't quite get himself to say, at least not out loud? You know what he's really thinking? Jesus isn't worth it. That's what he's thinking. Jesus isn't worth something that costs a year's wages. It's exactly what he's saying. Well, at least we know what you think, Judas. I spoke about virtue signaling last week. Uh, it's when you express your opinions publicly to demonstrate your good character. And that's exactly what Judas is doing here. He's inwardly filled with shame. And so because of that shame, he has to put stuff on the outside in the veneer to make himself look good, right? It's kind of like he's wearing this T-shirt, you know. Let's give to the poor. You know, that's the T-shirt he's wearing. Meanwhile, he's really thinking, let's give to the treasury so I can skim some. You can take that down. This is something that authentic Christ followers don't have to do. Judas felt shame on the inside, so he had to put on a fake veneer of righteousness, right? Christians can say, I don't feel any shame so anymore, so I don't have to make you think I'm so good. You hear me? That's what was going on in him. He's like, he's feeling so guilty. He goes, so I got to pretend on the outside. And that's what people do today, don't they? You know, they feel bad about what they're really doing, and so they do this virtue signaling where Christians say, no, actually, I'm pretty bad on the inside, and Jesus has forgiven me, so I don't have to show you how good I am. That's settled. Now, let me just talk about myself for a minute, and uh, I'm going to tell you some things that are bad about me, um, so get ready. I'm, and I'm just skimming the surface. I, myself, am a forgiven mess. I can tell you what's wrong with me, and it would probably take about an hour, um, but I'm just going to tell you a few things to kind of highlight a few. I have an addictive personality. I am controlling. That's my reputation around here. <laughs> yeah, see, you know that. You, you know that. That's why you're laughing. Um, I can get real snarky when I don't get my way. Just ask my wife. She would tell you that. She tells me that. I get hangry. Who else gets hangry? Come on, give me the hangry hands. Okay, we are in good company. All right. My thoughts can be impure. I am not by nature generous, and I don't like to follow rules that I think are stupid. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and Jesus loves to use this fool to do good because he loves to use fools who say, it's not me, it can't be me, it must be him. You know, as I was thinking about how bad a person I am, um, I was thinking <laughs> about how there's two kinds of Christian speakers in the world. I don't know if you, you know, I, I go to conferences from time to time. And uh, there's one kind I like and one kind I really don't like. Um, the one kind is the person who tells you what a winner they are and how you can win like them. You ever hear those kind of people? It's like, I got it, you know, here, I, I don't, I'm not really saying it, but obviously I'm a winner and you can be like me. I, I really don't like listening to those kind of people very much. Um, but, but they are kind of compelling. It's like, wow, could I be like you? Could I win like you? Uh, I remember... Um, Oh, the other kind of person is the person who tells you how messed, they, messed up they are and how good God is. That's the kind of person I like to listen to. Um, a number of years ago, uh, I used to go to conferences out of Willow Creek Church in Chicago. It was a mega big church that was, you know, mega successful. And there were certainly some people who would stand up there and say, you know, trying to kind of, you know, hide it. But, you know, yes, we're doing great. Yes, I'm powerful. Yes, I'm wonderful. And you can be more like me. And everybody was kind of in adoration. You know, there was this adulation for the success that you would see. And... Uh, but then one year I was there, and this guy got up to speak, and his name was Dan Allender. And Dan is a psychologist, and uh, he actually now has the Allender School of, uh, of Theology out in Seattle, where he works particularly with people who have sexual addictions. Uh, he has this program out there. But he hadn't done a lot of conference speaking prior to that. He got very popular after this because he came up, and, you know, most of the people looked pretty hip. You know, they'd put on their best, you know, non-tucked-in shirts, their slim pants and their cool beetle shoes, I got those, you know. They, they try to be as cool as they could, just like I did this morning. 
Uh, and Dan came out, and he looked like a total nerd. I mean, I'm going to show you a picture of him. This is him in his later years. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, he looks, you know, kind of hip Seattle, but, he, you know, he used to have the mustache and like a fro. And he, he, you know, but the thing was, he came out, and go ahead and take that down so we're not distracted by the beach. Um, he came out, and he talked about what a goofball he was and how God used him everybody, you know, anyway, and everybody fell in love with him. Let me just give you a couple of uh, his book titles. You know these books like, Leading Like a Champion. You know, You Can Conquer. You know what his were? It was called Leading with a Limp. And another one that was very popular was called The Wounded Healer. Now, when people have to tell you how great they are, they're most likely trying to cover some insecurity, right? Inner insecurity. And that's what Judas is doing. He's hiding the darkness within, and Jesus calls him out on it. Verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You're always going to have the poor among you. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Friends, if someone said this today, they'd get canceled faster than a bad poster stamp, right? He's saying, you're worried about giving to the poor. There's always going to be poor people around, but I'm here just for a little while, and it's better to spend a year's wages on me than giving it to poor people. I mean, let that sit with you for a second. Isn't it outrageous? Who says that kind of thing? Who says that kind of thing and doesn't come across as a megalomaniac? Don't give the poor, worship me. No one ever, except Jesus. Because worshiping Jesus, he's saying, worshiping me is the first thing. Every other good thing a person does has a broken root if it's not tethered to worshiping him. Now, that's a nice theological statement. Let me tell you what it means. It's not just because he's worthy of worship, but he is, because he is. It's because when he comes first, everything, you, everything else you do isn't for you. It's for him. And that cleans up your motives and allows you to do something that's not selfishly oriented in the process of serving others. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, there's a very... A lot of people serve others for themselves. But when you're worshiping Jesus, you're saying, no, you come first. What can I do for you? It's not about me anymore. And all of a sudden, those things become radically purified. Now, it's an odd statement Jesus makes. He says, she's preparing me for burial. And again, he knows what's coming. He's in complete control. Let's go on to verse 9 through 11. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. I mean, have you noticed that before? I didn't really notice it when I was saying that before. It's like, he was dead once, and they're going to kill him again. This guy can't get a break. Wow. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Now, I want to tell you something about the religious life. It can make you better, but it can also make you worse. Do you know that? You see that in Christians as well, who are, well, frankly, they're just worse. You know, they're getting worse. And it made these chief priests worse. And that's because they had gotten their power by being religious, and they didn't want to lose it. So they, uh, you know, they hadn't become good. They held on to their power so that they could appear superior to other people. Do you get that? So they used their religion to appear superior to people, and people still do that today. We use religion maybe to justify pride and hatred, and that's a terrible thing. That's what they were doing. It's like, I don't want to lose my power. Now, let's finish off the passage, and then I'll make a few last comments, and then we'll finish up. The next day, the great crowd that had come to, for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches, and that's the Palm Sunday part, and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! God saves, as Matt said earlier. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that the, these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So they get that perspective. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. And actually what commentators say is there's a crowd coming down from Bethany and then there's a crowd coming up from Jerusalem and the two meet and then they begin to follow Jesus. That's what's going on here. 
Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, I want to close the message by talking about two types of people who missed Jesus. First were the religious people who missed him, and it was because they made their life about using religion to get power, and Jesus was a threat to their ability to use and maintain control, because they were all about control, which is the worst thing you can do with religion, right? You take your religion, you take your faith, and you try to control people with it, and that's why they missed him. But the crowd, a lot of the crowd missed him too, because what they really were looking for was a great show, and Jesus was putting on a phenomenal show. And this was a day before TV. I mean, you know, this was a good show to watch. When I was 21, I missed Jesus. I tell this story from time to time, so bear with me if you've heard it before. I, I tell the story of how I was walking down a beach in Florida with an acquaintance of mine who had this new relationship with Jesus, and he was telling me about it. And you know how you have moments in your life you can snapshot? I can snapshot the first time I saw my wife. And I remember, I remember the, the moment I was walking with him, and I said, Tom, that's good for you. And, and of course, I meant it. Why didn't it hit? Because God, it wasn't my time. God hadn't opened my heart and said, this is your time. I wasn't looking. I wasn't searching. But then a year later, God must have prompted him to pick up the phone. He called me, how are you doing? That was the most consequential question everybody, anybody ever asked me in my life. Because at that moment, I said to him, there's something missing from my life, and I don't know what it is. Well, you tell a Christian that, and they're like, they're like a dog on meat. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm coming right over. <laughs> And I want to, have you ever felt that way, that there's something missing in your life? Because if you have, or if you are, what that is, is it's God's spirit, and he's calling you. He calls us. He says, this is your time, Mark. Now you feel that need, and I'm here, and I'm going to meet that need. And once again, this room here is full of people who've heard that call and responded to it. And God's filled that void for us. So Palm Sunday, that's what today is. A bunch of people right there with Jesus. They're right there with him. And some of them just think they're welcoming a local miracle worker. Surely none of them grasped in fullness who he was. Others are so mad they want to kill him and the ex-dead guy. And I want to say, Jesus was there, but Jesus is here right now. He's actually here in this room. Because he said, and look at the passage from Matthew 18, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now, I'm not great at mental math, but I think we, we met the, uh, the quota. Two or three gathering in his name. And what did he promise? He is here. Now, over the next week, I want to ask you to do something so that you don't miss the opportunity that he may be calling you or calling you deeper. And I'm going to just put up three steps here. I want to ask you to read chapters 18 through 21 of John's Gospel. If you need to, you know, take a picture of that so you can remember, do it. Then, and it's pretty simple, come either Wednesday or Thursday night, 7 o'clock service, as we Come to communion by way of the crosses, and Joel will be leading us in that. Come to those services. They are the most impactful services of the year. They always have been here. So come to one of those services, and then come Easter Sunday. And while you are doing those things, while you're reading through those chapters, say this simple prayer. God, let me see your love for me this week. Get that? God, let me see your love for me this week. He loves to hear that prayer. Let's see what he'll do in all of our lives. Would you pray with me? God, let us see your love for us this week. Just like Mary saw your love for her and fell at your feet in worship and didn't care what anybody thought about what she did, Help us become those kind of people who say, I, I don't really care what anybody thinks, but I do love Jesus because he's loved me so. Honestly, when we experience that kind of love, we don't even think of hiding our adoration for you. You are real. 
You are alive because you rose from the dead, and you are here in this place today, and you are meeting us. And if someone feels, boy, this guy's speaking right to me, it's because you're speaking right to them, not me, it's you. And you do that, and you've been doing it for thousands of years. So let us hear your voice as we say, God, let me see your love for me this Easter week. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.